This morning's good news is found in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went right into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabbanon, Rabbanoni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you know, I've been doing this sermon series on Jesus for about three months now. Are you getting tired of hearing of Jesus? No. I hope not. Thank you, Gloria. I hope not, because here we go again. We thought we got rid of Jesus by hanging him on a cross last Friday, but three days later, poof, here he is. He's back. So at last, we come to what is perhaps the most offensive part of the story. In Jesus, words took on muscles. Jesus is God Almighty, daring to get physical. God Almighty, 
with a body in action. Of course, everyone knows that Jesus slept, ate, wept, bled, and died an agonizing death. What is really mysterious is that empty tomb. Jesus was back in a resurrected body. His after Easter body, recognizable to those who had known him before, enabled him, invited or not, to share a number of meals and a few arguments with his astonished followers, which became for them irrefutable proof that Christ was raised from the dead. And yet Jesus came and went in an instant, unconfined by time and space, moving through doors and appearing at the most awkward moments. When we confess, we believe in the resurrection of the body, we're saying we believe God raised Jesus from the dead and that God will someday raise us not as ghosts or disembodied spirits, but as a person with a recognizable body, a recognizable personality. However, the remaining details, such as when or how or why, are still a matter of speculation. Nevertheless, the Apostle Paul tells us that our perishable bodies must put on the imperishable and our mortal bodies must put on immortality and we shall be changed. Like Jesus, we'll have resurrected bodies. In the meantime, Paul is convinced that Jesus is no longer confined even to this remarkable resurrected body, but has a widely dispersed body that races towards Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so we confess not only that we believe in Jesus Christ, but also that we believe in the one holy Catholic Church. Now I know it's hard enough to believe that Jesus is God Almighty daring to get physical. I suspect it's even harder to believe that the Church, with all of its foibles and follies, is the Son of God's holy body. Yet Paul assures us, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Paul says that Christ has many diverse body parts, and we're it. We're all in this together. Not because we are all of one mind, not because we like each other, but because we've got one Lord who just loves to bring people together, using them as his hands, his feet, his eyes, and his mouth. If the world is going to meet Jesus, it will meet him in his body. The church, or not at all. Jesus says to the world that to receive one of his followers is to welcome him. And whoever welcomes him welcomes God. Christ is not merely with us. He is in us. We are Jesus' presence in the world. Even though the world treats Jesus' presence pretty much in the same way it treated him. Paul said that, we, that he carried in his own body the death of Jesus 
so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our bodies. Paul, in calling the Christian community Jesus' body, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul's talk of the body makes Jesus more than a helpful example or a wise spiritual guru. Jesus is God's great rescue operation. Lots of people believe that Jesus lived a noble life, made some profound statements, was unjustly crucified, and even rose from the dead. But show them a church, and they'll never believe that such a ragtag collection of losers could have any connection to what they admire about Jesus. Oh, the boredom, the irrelevance, its smug self-righteousness. I could go on. I'm familiar with the church. I'm familiar with its weaknesses. You see, I'm one of them. It may be Christ's body, but it's a crucified body with gaping wounds and nail holes in its hands and in its feet. And yet when Paul sees the church, he sees Christ's virginal bride. Apparently the old gal, for all her lured past, go ahead, read a little church history. You'll discover the church fools around a lot. Nevertheless, she looks pretty good when made up for worship on Sunday or serving soup to the poor come Monday. Despite all the unflattering portraits of the church, every time the church gathers for a family meal, a Bible study, a sermon, a pontifical high mass, or a holy roller meeting, we do so with Christ's own promise that he is there reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus never was too discriminating in deciding with whom to party, still isn't. Jesus, you see, is friend of sinners, so it shouldn't surprise us if a few of them show up on church. It's where we belong. As one of my professors said, if you find the perfect church, join it. Once you do, it's no longer perfect. You see, for now, the rescue operation continues. Not everything wrong with this life has been set right. Not everything about the church looks like it's supposed to be. But every once in a while, the church tells a story, or is the story, so that all might believe that God has shown up in Jesus. I'm in the business of words. As a Lutheran, I think the world of words. But I doubt Jesus would have been crucified. And I'm pretty sure there would be no church if all we had were words about Jesus. The thing that attracted some people and really disturbed others was Jesus himself. It was not the church's pumped up memories of Jesus or sentimental notions about Jesus that birthed the church. It was Jesus. So if you're looking for, for evidence of the resurrection here this morning, you found it. Just look at the church. You and me 
In fact, millions more gathered throughout the world in Jesus' name. Proof of the continued presence of Jesus. Now you may have noticed that there are different ways in which Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the story of Easter. The gospel writers, with all their limited human experience, struggled to describe this event that had so turned their world upside down. They told the story in the most honest way they could, admitting their doubts as well as their conviction that it's all true. If you have trouble accepting the resurrection, you're in good company. Nobody was more surprised by Jesus' resurrection than his own disciples. It was an event that scared them half out of their wits. On the other hand, if this is making sense to you, if you believe there is a good chance that this is true, that also is a sure sign that the risen presence of Christ has come near you. You see, we call this presence the Holy Spirit. The Spirit teaches, explains, empowers, prods, and encourages. Jesus told his disciples that when, not if, but when they haul you before the authorities, do not be anxious about what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Paul tells us that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. That's how it is with Jesus. You don't have to struggle to find him. He finds you. So beware. You have reason to be nervous. Jesus is good at getting what he wants and what Jesus wants most is you. This is your guarantee, your down payment of what is to come, a taste of the glory yet to be revealed. Jesus made a promise about that too, which might just force even the most pious among us to crack a smile. Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. Yes, the party was interrupted. It's been a long interruption, 2,000 years and counting. But you see, it was interrupted for you so that you might be part of it. Come, be dangerous, pass the bread, share the wine, take up the cross, peek into the empty tomb. And if it awakens some joy and anticipation in you, just that, I expect, covers a multitude of sins. Indeed, all the sins you've got. And you know what? You're not even going to have to worry about driving home. You're going to be home already. So let the party continue as it was intended. Christ is risen. Amen.